Hello, good morning. Hello everybody out there. It's Dr Chips here. I don't want to shout too loud because I've got a guest with me this morning to start the week, Make a Monday. After I mentioned that I had a cat the other week, how you doing buddy? Loads of people emailed saying, oh can we see your cat? So here he is. This is Dylan. Say hello, say hello to the camera Dylan. There we go. Am I holding you all right there? I don't want you to um, shout down the microphone to everyone. This is Dylan, um, and he's a kitty. He is one of the most obedient, uh, chilled cats I know, although he's going to try now and get away because he wants to go outside. And I just wanted to say, get him, say hello to everyone. Everyone that's been emailing saying, can we see your cat? Here he is. Um, do you want to go outside and play now? Yeah, I can see you looking. Come on then. All right, off we go. Here we go. Out you go. There he goes. So there we go. That was Dylan. Hello, everybody. I couldn't hold him for any longer than that. He wanted to go outside and play. He's probably going to go outside and find some of his friends on the street that I mentioned the other week. Um, but I hope you all got to have a good look at him there. He's a lovely cat and he might just wander uh, around in the background of some of these videos in the future. So how are we all doing? Lovely to see you all through the camera here. It's week two. Um, of learning at home and it's back to Maker Mondays with a twist today because we've got a kind of two-part um, session today. We've got the interview that I wanted to play on Friday but we couldn't quite get the technology working but it is sorted and I'm going to dive straight into that in a minute. Um, that's the interview with doc a scientist Dr Ed Reagan who's going to talk all a bit about the virus, what viruses are and how we can protect ourselves. It's really interesting stuff. And then we're going to build some towers. You might be able to see I've been having a go this morning at building some towers. So we're going to get stuck into those as well. So, but before I do that, let's start by just saying a huge well done to everybody that took part in the different activities last week. Uh, my YouTube channel, it may, it really, this really made me laugh. It said that you've got 7,600 views last week, which is incredible. And then underneath it said this is 7,550 more than usual, which shows how many views that I normally get. But to be fair, I don't often put videos up. But, yeah, but that is incredible. Nearly 8,000 views. Think of all the paper helicopters, robotic arms, uh, crazy characters that have been created um, in last week. And we've got loads of really interesting activities coming up this week. Um, today we're doing our towers. Let me just, can I remember it all? Tomorrow we're going to look at this really important skill called abstraction with barefoot computing. Wednesday, we're doing runny rainbows with sweets. You might have seen that the rainbow has become a bit of a symbol of happiness and optimism um, at this time. And you might see if people have been creating rainbows. So we're going to do our own science experiment with Skittles or M&Ms or other coloured sweets to make our own rainbows. Really cool one that. That's with the great science share. Thursday, what did I say we were doing? Oh yes, Thursday we're making our own magnifying glass. We're going to explore the science of refraction, build our own magnifying glass, that's very cool. And then Friday's all about rocks and you need some chocolate, some white and dark chocolate for that. All simple experiments, don't need a lot of stuff that you can do at home. So let's start by sharing some of your great work from last Friday session. Let's go to the showcase blog. Here we go. Uh, so last Friday's experiment was our clean and dirty hands bread experiment, which we set going. This is an observation over time. So it wasn't something that happened immediately, but over the coming days and weeks, we're going to keep looking at this and seeing what we notice. And here are some people that took part in this and sent their photos in. We've got Max and Phoebe from Northern Dun with their bread and they reported in saying day three, no visible changes as yet. Great to know that they're keeping a close eye on things. We've got Usman setting his up with his clean hands and dirty hands. Remember, we wiped our hands on uh, parts around the home where we thought there might be it might be a bit unclean and then rub that on our bread. Then we washed our hands 
rubbed our clean hands on our bread. He also sent me in his prediction. I think that the bread labelled dirty hands is going to rot because more bacteria is on it. Interesting. He also then said, please email me back if I'm correct or not. Well, I'm sorry, Usman, as I said in the email, I'm not going to tell you whether you're correct or not. You're going to find out whether you're correct or not by doing this investigation. Here's Harris uh, exposing his blind spot. I think that he really liked that one. He sent me a very enthusiastic email saying it was a cool experiment, that. Demonstrating how his brain is lying to him. We've got Yusha and Zachariah's experiment. They're ready to go there. Oh, good point. They've put the date on it. I should have done that with mine, really. It shows you, reminds you of when you started. Oh, as did Harry Moss. Um, they put the date on very good. And they also think the dirty bread will get mouldy quicker. We shall find out. So well done to all of those people who sent the pictures in from uh, last... Friday's experiment. Let me just come back to that camera there. Um, and then I've also got some other people on the register straight away this week. They wanted a shout out. Remember, if you would like your, uh, if you'd like me to say hello to you as part of the register, then just email me on uh, Dr. Chips Daily Dose at gmail.com. We'll get your parents to. She probably haven't got an email address. But I want to say hello and well done to Harry Atkin, um, who sent, I saw a picture of their helicopter that they've created. So I've added that to the helicopter section of the showcase blog. It's on there. Um, so well done to Harry. Charlie as well. Um, brilliant video. He, Charlie actually sent me a video, uh, well mentioned me in a video across Twitter. Um, that I hadn't seen before, doing do an experiment I hadn't seen before. It's fantastic, where you had these paper flowers that unfold as a result of putting them in water. I don't actually know the science that's going on there, so I'm going to have to uh, be curious and find out a little bit more. But thank you for that, Charlie. Paige Mallet um, in Wallingham in Surrey, down, down south in Surrey. Mum says you've done all of the experiments, you tune in, in every day, and that's wonderful. Um, and then we've got some regulars. We've got Jessica and Harry Clay, who are always tuning in. Hassan, who's always tuning in. Great Sonic picture, by the way, you sent me. It wasn't linked to anything we did, but loved it. Loved it. Um, and Samira Tabassum, as well, sent me uh, some pictures of work that they've been doing at home. So, uh, if I've missed anyone, I'm really, really sorry. I'm just getting lots of people sending them in, which is brilliant. And if you want your... Uh, name and work to be shared, just get your parents to send it in via email. Just a reminder as well, before we get into this week's uh, lesson, um, if you want your parents to know what experiments are coming up next week, or if I'm talking to parents here, if you want to know, make sure you go on the website www.drchips.weebly.com and then just fill out the contact form to subscribe. I think I realise that some people, when I've been saying subscribe, you've been say, subscribing to my YouTube channel, which is great. Um, but this way, I get your email address, and on Friday afternoon, I send out all of the following week's experiments and what you need. Okay, so uh, go on there and subscribe to that if you haven't already. Right, okay, let's get into it. Really excited about this going to play you now an interview that I did with Dr. Ed Reagan. Now, Ed, and I explained this in the video, is a childhood friend from primary school. And through Facebook and other social media, which you can have when you're a bit older, we've kept in contact a bit, occasionally sharing scientific stories. And the other week, uh, I said, could I interview him about viruses? Now, um, uh, I thought about, when I was talking to Ed, I thought about whether or not we wanted to do this or not, because maybe some of us have just a bit fed up hearing about the virus, but it's really important, I think, that we understand a little bit about the science of viruses, use this opportunity to understand the science of viruses, and also to understand the science which explains why we're being asked to stay in, you're being asked to wash your hands, you're being asked not to touch your face. So I found this fascinating talking to Ed. I hope you do too. About 10 minutes or so. Um, so I'm going to play the interview to you now and then, um, then I'm going to ask you some questions afterwards to check that you are listening. Okay, here we go. So here's the interview with Ed. Hello. 
Hello, good to see you. Yeah, how you doing? Very well, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you, Ed, for uh, for offering to do this. I was just trying to work out. Uh, we haven't spoken about about best best part of thirty years. I think it must be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, isn't technology great? We've stayed in touch, uh, and then uh, can just dial you up just like that, which is great. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. One, one benefit of the isolation. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Think of the positives. So. Uh, for everyone that's watching, this is my primary school friend, Ed, uh, Dr. Ed Reagan, who is a scientist and worked on lots of interesting projects um, over the last few years. And the company that you're working for at the moment, let me get this right, so you're, do you specialise in creating equipment which is ultimately going to help develop a vaccine for the virus. Is that right, broadly speaking? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. Okay. So Go on, go on. So, sorry, so we're yeah, developing uh, genetic sequencing instruments so that we can sequence the uh, genetic code of the viruses. Right, okay, cool. It's very, very technical stuff. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's fascinating. And I've already learned, I, I'll be honest, I've learned uh, loads in, as we were talking and setting up this call, I've learned loads myself. So it, it, it's been great. Thanks so much. So um, what we're going to do is we've got some questions that we're going to sort of go through because... One of the reasons I wanted to speak with yourself is just to understand a little bit the science of the virus. Um, I think that I hear lots of pupils, uh, they're being told to do things like wash their hands or not touch their face, but don't necessarily understand the sort of science of why. So they're being told the what, what to do, but not necessarily the why. So um, I thought if we just had a little bit of a chat, and, and you can explain things far better than I can, um, about the science of, of, of viruses and vaccines and all the rest of it. Is that okay? Is that, uh, sure is that thing. okay? Sounds great. Okay, cool. So if you wouldn't mind, could you start just by explaining actually what a virus is? Because, you know, the V word is everywhere at the moment, but what, what actually is it? Yep, sure, sure. Well, viruses, uh, firstly, they're very, very tiny little particles. Okay. And so small, in fact, that you can't even see them with a normal microscope. Now, it actually takes a very special piece of equipment called uh, an electron microscope to be able to see them. Okay. And just a little fact to you here, so yeah. you've got a single little pin. So on the end of that pin there, you could actually yeah. fit around 500 million of them. So wow. very small. Okay, so on the end of the pin... 500 million of these individual viruses. Right, okay, so yeah, very, very small, very small. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so thanks for explaining, uh, you know, kind of what they are. But if we get into the kind of nitty-gritty of what they are actually made of, you know, you said that there's a bit of debate about when, whether or not they're live. What what actually are they? It, it's in them, then. Yeah, so whilst viruses aren't cells, they're, they're actually made up of the same things. So, uh, firstly, the core of them, uh, are made, they have something called nucleic acid, uh, okay. which can either be a chemical called DNA or RNA. Right. And this nucleic acid basically contains the genetic code or the instructions for host cells to make more viruses. And then around this DNA, RNA, the virus has a protective capsule, which right. we call a, cap a capsid. Okay, a capsid was that. That's right, yeah. Okay, so that's the bit round the outside. And then now, uh, pupils can probably have heard of DNA um, because we, in year six, we talk about process of evolution. And I talk a little bit, uh, rightly or wrongly, about DNA being kind of an instruction manual for how to build you and the features. What was the other one that you mentioned, though? RNA, is that similar to DNA? That's right. It's a very similar molecule, and, it, and it's a, it's actually the uh, kind of intermediate uh, molecule between uh, DNA and making proteins, which are the kind of building blocks of cells. Okay, so your your you, your proteins are like your Lego bricks for building cells, and then your cells are Lego bricks for building bigger things, and eventually you end up with you and I. That's right. There we go. That's it. In, in simple terms, that's how it works. Okay. So, um, so we talked a bit about what a virus is, what it's made of. So what can we um, do to stop these viruses infecting us then? Yeah, well, generally we actually have to rely on our own body's defence, which is called the immune system, uh, to protect us from these viruses. Uh, 
Because unlike with bacterial infections, we don't actually have many drugs like antibiotics to attack viral infections. However, scientists have been able to help our own immune system to fight certain viral diseases by producing something called a, a vaccine. Okay, yeah, so pupils have probably heard uh, quite a bit about this idea of vaccine. We talked about it a bit, bit in school. Um, so, uh, and the vaccines we understand are sort of being developed at the moment. So can you just expand a little bit on what a sort of vaccine is then? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, a vaccine or a vaccination is basically a way of training our immune system to recognise certain pathogens like viruses. Uh, the way this is done for viruses is often by injecting people with a weakened ver version of the virus or maybe bits of protein from the virus. And what this does, this really allows the body to become primed and ready for when a real infection happens. And so the immune system can then act quickly to destroy the viruses. OK, so it's like, um, so you get a little bit of the actual virus, but in a kind of weakened state, so it's not as kind of dangerous and, and then from that your body learns how to fight it if the full-on virus comes along that's right okay so okay so i was kind of lightening it in my head there to sports teams who you know where they kind of watch other teams training just to kind of gen up on their attack mechanisms so they're ready for them when they play them that kind of thing but in chemical biological terms is that is that is that okay as an explanation that's a nice analogy right yeah. okay okay cool so um now is so is the coronavirus different to regular viruses what actually is the coronavirus then okay so well could coronaviruses they're a group of viruses uh, that infect birds and mammals uh, obviously including humans right okay uh the word corona actually comes from the greek meaning crown and um, when you see, look at these viruses under the electron microscope, you can actually see that they have little, a little crown of spikes around them, which are basically part of the protective capsid and also the bit which the viruses use to bind onto the host cells. OK. Yeah. So this particular coronavirus that's causing the problems at the moment, um, we call COVID-19. Yep. It's actually not terribly harmful for the majority of people. And the, the good news is that generally young people like children are particularly resistant to the disease. Uh, but the real, real issue here is that even though it may not be very dangerous for young people, you can still carry the disease and pass it on to others, So even without knowing that you actually have it. And the reason why that's a problem is that many older people and people with weakened immune systems or lungs, such as if you have diabetes or asthma, can unfortunately become very ill from it. OK, so, so children could actually get this and their symptoms be so weak that they wouldn't even know that they've had it, potentially. Mm -hmm. But they are, they're passing it on. I think the term I've seen is super spreaders. Is that right? <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So they're, they're kind of passing it on. Uh, so have we got um, a vaccine yet for COVID-19, this particular coronavirus? Okay. Well, well for COVID-19 at the moment, the answer is no. Okay. But scientists are working extremely hard all around the world to uh, develop a one. And the company that I work for actually is helping to enable researchers to understand the genetic code of this virus. Um, so what knowing the genetic code of COVID-19 does is to help scientists find out which bit of the virus or proteins to target to produce a vaccine. And, and the hope really will be that a vaccine will be, will be produced in the next year or so. Yep. Although this can take some time because scientists basically have to prove that the vaccinations are firstly effective and also, more, most importantly, safe for people to take. Yeah, sure. So there's this kind of, yes, we want them to be hurrying along with this as best they can, but we also want it to be safe when it's yeah. released. Yeah, that's the balance. OK, so so when, when we started, I said that one of the reasons I wanted to speak to yourself, Ed, and thanks so much for explaining all this, is that so to share the science with the young people pupils so that they understand the the why is as well as the what so just come and kind of full circle what can they do at the moment um then if we don't have a vaccine to protect both themselves and the wider society but also why why are they being asked to do those things can you just explain that to us if you don't mind absolutely so i mean there are certainly things we can do now. There's, uh, and the best strategies that, that we have really are to firstly to stop the virus from spreading and stop them entering our body. And there's actually some very simple ways that we can do that. 
So the most important one is to wash hands with soap. Uh, it's very important that it's soap and not just water. Right, why so is soap, that then? Go on, why? Yeah, so, well, really, soap is lethal to viruses because okay. the, the protective capsule that I mentioned of the virus is not resistant to soap. Um, mainly, this is because, really, it's made up of lipids, which are like fats. Right. And soap is incredibly good at breaking down fats, and as we know from when we do the washing up, for example. Yeah, so. yeah. And also, on a typical surface, the coronavirus can actually survive for many hours, if not days. So keeping surfaces clean is very mm -hmm. important, again, using a soapy detergent. Also... Uh, these viruses can't actually penetrate your skin, but they can get into your body through your eyes and through your mouth. Okay, so, so they can't just go... If they land on you, they can't go in... They can't penetrate your skin, they can't get inside you. No, it's right. no, very unlikely. Okay. So as well as keeping your hands very clean with soap, it's important not to touch your eyes or your hands... Oh, sorry, or your mouth with your hands. Okay. So... Okay. Um, so I actually... I didn't... So that explains it. So actually, even though... I've been, and I, uh, and I bet if you watch this back, unfortunately, I've probably touched my face a couple of times. So <laughs> I'm not practicing what I should be preaching. From now on, my hands are staying down here. But I hadn't really thought through that, you know, the why. That it actually, I might have touched something um, if I've been out today um, and the virus is on it. But unless I touch my mouth or sort of nose and eyes, it's not, it's not going to get into my system. And then if I go and wash my hands with soap, Thoroughly, happy birthday, twice, 20 seconds. That, that's, as you said, it's lethal to the virus, the soap. That's, that's right, yeah. Okay. And I think there's only one more important yeah, go, point sorry, there, go, really, go. which is, yeah, really, really finally to cover your cough and your sneeze. So every time you cough and sneeze, the viruses can be pushed out into the air, yeah. where people, people near to you can breathe them in. And so basically that, that's it, really. So the things that we need to, need to do are to hand wash. Yeah. Uh, not touch our eyes and face, uh, keep surfaces clean, uh, cover your cough, yep. and, and just generally as well, limit your contact with other people. And that, those are the best defences we really have. Yep. Okay, there we go. So pleased that I got to play that video and it all went fine. Well, it looked like it went fine. Fascinating in interview. Thank you again to Dr. Ed Reagan. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, so in terms of testing you, you can, you can just say this in your head at home, but I, as I said before we watched the interview, what I, I loved about Ed's explanations is that it cleared up in my mind why we're being asked to do these things. So why are we, are we being asked to separate from other people? Because if we're coughing and sneezing, um, that can uh, cause other people to become infected. Um, because the virus can transmit through the air and then go into a person's uh, body through their mouth. Um, why are we being asked not to touch our face and, uh, yeah, our face, our mouth and nose and eyes? Because the virus can't just go through our skin. It can't get into us. Um, it can only get into us if it happens to have landed on us and then we t or we touch something which has that virus on it. Um, and then we touch our mouth or our eyes or our nose, then it can get into our body. Why are we being asked to wash our hands with soap? Well, as Ed put it wonderfully, soap is lethal to the virus. The virus, the outside of the virus is made up of fat molecules, and soap is what we use to wash up the fat when we do a roast dinner like I did yesterday. It's lethal to the viruses. And final fun fact from that video, is the fact that on the tip of a pin, the tip of a pin, 500 million viruses. That's how tiny they are. So thank you to Ed. Remember that Ed is going to act as our expert. So if you've got any questions, I've already got ones from my mum um, about how long the virus can last out on the side on the surface. If you've got other questions that you want to put to Ed, send them in via email. When I've got a few together, Ed and I are going to do another call. So thank you, Ed. Uh, now, for something completely different, and I'm conscious of time, um, I've managed to keep all these to half an hour so far, but it looks like this one might run over a little bit. Uh, let's have a look at some tower building as our Maker Monday challenge. And to get us 
get our inspiration going first. Let's have a look at some of the tallest towers in the world. Here I have two pictures of two wonderful towers. The first one on the left there is the tallest tower in the United Kingdom, um, tallest building. That is the Shard down in London. I've been uh, a long way up. I didn't go the whole way to the top, but me and my wife went up the uh, about up, I think about two thirds of the way um, for a few drinks in a restaurant one evening when we were down in London for Christmas, which was lovely. And I haven't been to the one on the right, the Burj Khalifa, but this is the tallest tower in the world and it's based in Dubai. Now, there is loads of science and engineering which goes into building these towers, and this is the kind of thing we're going to explore a bit today. But just to give you an idea of how tall the Burj Khalifa is, on this image here, we have the Burj Khalifa on the left-hand side. This is some of the tallest towers in the world, and it is so much taller than the Shard in London. The Shard doesn't even get on this graphic. The Shard is a mere 310 metres tall, um, which is about a third, or just, just over a third of the Burj Khalifa. The Burj Khalifa really is incredibly tall. Um, 830 odd metres, which is nearly, nearly a kilometre, 170 more metres and it would be a kilometre into the sky, which is just phenomenal and it's built on an area in the world uh, where the ground is very sandy as well. So how do they make these tall towers? By the way, I always thought it was cheating a little bit when they put these spikes on the top of them. Can you see a lot of these here just have like poles at the top? Does that count as part of the height? Because you could just put a really tall pole on the top, couldn't you? Anyway, we digress. So let's have a look at an, the pictures of another famous um, tall building. This is the Eiffel Tower. I forgot the name of it then. The Eiffel Tower in Paris, in France. And what I want you to do, because there's a clue in this about how to build tall towers successfully. Have a close look a second. What shape do you see a lot of in the in the structure of the Eiffel Tower. If you have a look, what do you see? Do you see lots of circles? Not really. Do you see lots of rectangles? Not really. Octagons? No. Ah, what three-sided shape? I can hear, I can feel you all shouting at the screen now. It is triangles. Okay, look at how many triangles there are here. We've got triangle here. Oh, sorry, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor. But if you just look on the main legs of the Eiffel Tower, everything is broken down into triangles. And I want you to keep that in mind today for your challenge because that is going to help you. Now, this is one of the ones today where I'm just going to give you a little demonstration. I don't want you following along as I do it because I want you to take your time uh, and, and have a go at home, however long it might take you to build a tower. But your task today is ever so simple. It is using some paper, scissors and sellotape, whatever paper you might have at home. I'm using an old magazine here that I've read, great magazine all about aeroplanes. Um, to build the tallest tower you possibly can. And here I've started mine, okay? Now, let me just show you this, first of all, why triangles are better than squares. And let's go to the dual camera for this. Here we go. So to make this, let me give you a little a few top tips. All you do with your paper, okay, cool. look at this interesting article on uh, aircraft that could travel at 6,000 miles an hour. That was a cool one. Um, you take your paper, make sure if you're ripping up mum and dad's magazines, they've finished reading it. Or you can use newspaper, magazines, whatever paper you might have around. And the first thing we need to do is turn our flimsy paper into something where we can, a construction material that we can start building out of. And the best way to do that is to roll it up. So by rolling it up like so and then putting a little bit of 
sticky tape around it, silo tape. Let's see if I have any more luck finding the end today than I did in the video yesterday. I should have been a little bit more prepared. Oh, there it is, there it is. Okay, a little bit of silo tape, I need one bit. And I'll put that on the side there. And I'll need another bit. Okay, so the first thing that you need to do these are your sort of beams that you're making for construction of your tower. All right, so roll this up like so. Okay, and there we go. Simple as that to make a beam. Now straight away, as soon as you roll this up, you get a lot more strength to it. So I can place that there and I've got a cup here and I can almost, I mean it won't balance, but can almost place a cup on that and it will actually be strong enough to support it so the first step is to make yourself a load of these beams because these are your construction materials and then you need just like with the Eiffel Tower to start building it up into a construction and as I said the challenge is simple how high can you go but let me just show you why triangles are good and squares are bad here is one I started this morning before I remembered about the whole triangle square thing. And look how unstable this is, okay? There's really no strength there in that, what we call plane. It, it just flexes, it moves. If I tried building that and then securing it, it's, look at that, rubbish, okay? But, and this is a big but, triangles are far, far better. Here I've got two together, but if you even look at each one, the flex in them is nowhere near. Look, really stiff already, okay? So here, this is, this is my, my tower, okay? Um, so I've started, uh, I've, I've, all I've done is I've combined two of these together to give me a bigger tr uh, beam, and then I've combined those in A3 for my base triangle. It's nice and stable. And then I've started building off of that. I think I might have another triangle up here and one up here, okay? Or maybe I could build another triangular base here and then build another tower on top. I'm not too sure. I'm going to tinker with things and I'm gonna work it out as I go. But I hope, in fact, if I get an opportunity, I'll finish this off later on and I'll show you tomorrow. Um, I hope to build a really tall tower. I tell you what, a good challenge is to see if you can build a tower taller than yourself. Okay, now I've done this in year two uh, at my school and some of them actually managed it. So that is a good benchmark. So there you go. There's Maker Monday's uh, tinkering challenge to build a tower out of newspaper. How high can you go? And if you want to make it even trickier for yourself, here's two ideas to try. One, see if your tower can actually hold a weight, okay? So find something, make sure it's something safe. You don't want to use a cup of tea or anything like that. Maybe a toy car or a teddy or something like that. Oh, teddy would be a good one if you've uh, got a teddy on like a viewing platform. Imagine they're at the top of your Burj Khalifa. See if you can build it so it's strong enough to hold the teddy. And then the second one, and this is a favorite of mine, is is it stable enough to withstand, let me just change that picture there, is it stable enough to stay standing in an earthquake? And the way you can test this, okay, is you build it and then get mum, dad, or whoever's at home, big brother or sister, grab the table, that you've built it on and give it a good shake. I'm not gonna do it on this one because if I scratch the floor, I'm in a lot of trouble with my wife, okay? But give it a good shake and see if your table comes tumbling down, your table, your tower comes tumbling down or withstands the earthquake. So there we go, there's Maker Monday. Lovely to see you all. I don't think I've forgotten anything. Tomorrow is Computational Thinking Tuesday. I'm going to be reading out two of the best algorithms which were sent in from last week for the crazy characters and we're going to be looking at some abstraction activities. Have a wonderful day 
and send in pictures of your tarots. Please send them in. I love getting them. I love putting them on the blog. It's Dr. Chips Daily Dose at gmail.com. I will see you tomorrow. Bye for now. Thank you.